Welcome, everybody, to the American Space Museum. I'm Mark Marquette. We're so glad you're with us to stay curious today with the one and only Mr. Terry White. Hello, Terry. Hi. How are you, buddy? Oh, just glad to be here today. Well, we're glad to always have Terry here once a month sharing stories about the amazing space shuttle and its three-decade legacy that we love talking about on Stay Curious and promote highly here at the American Space Museum in downtown Titusville. And our green screen here, Terry, is our subject today, hurricanes. Out there where you work, the Kennedy Space Center, how did y'all handle them and and how uh, things were going there? Well, I think, yeah. Yeah, well, we're pretty lucky because this area out of all of Florida, very seldom gets hit and really impacted by a hurricane. But that doesn't mean you can't be prepared. So NASA did a lot of work to prepare for the hurricanes, especially when we had a flight vehicle outside, but even when it's inside, the damage that a hurricane can do. So um, early in the program, Columbia had arrived here Easter weekend in 1979. And then in the fall of 1979, uh, Hurricane Davis showed up mm, wow. and we had a lot of people here from California since the orbiter had not been completed in California so they were here working on it and the California people were used to earthquakes but they were afraid of hurricanes <laughs> so it was a total different environment with those people most of them just stayed away from work for several days while we did the preps and, and continued to work uh, with the hurricane, it didn't do any damage. So uh, in those days, we only had one orbiter to worry about. But later in the program, then we had multiple orbiters and multiple hangars. Then uh, we had a lot more to worry about. So we had several days of preparations to get the facilities ready to uh, <clears throat> withstand the damage of a hurricane and get all of our crews lined up. We had a thing called ride out crews that if the hurricane <clears throat> projection was bad enough, that they were going to make people stay home because some of them wanted to evacuate, but to stay home, we actually had a group of technicians that would ride out the storm mm -hmm. right here. In our case, in the orbiter processing facility, we had hangars one and two, and my office was in uh, hangar one, and the ride out crew used my office mm -hmm. as their place to ride out the storm oh. because it was unique. It was actually a concrete building inside the hangar. We're going to hear some more stories from Terry. We're going to hear see some pictures of this. Talk about the right out crew or the, the 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 whole management tree structure. I'll show you here a little bit. One of the things that's great about being here, Terry, is I run into things all the time. Orbiter. This is why we're doing this show today. There's the hurricane preparedness plan from 2004 that you were part of this. Before we get too wound up in here, I wanted to say hi to everybody out there. Let them know that Terry White is a true lifer of the space shuttle program. You showed up when? 1978. 1978. The orbiter hadn't even been here yet. Uh, and think of this hurricane that we're looking at Adelia. This is the one bearing down this year on our space coast it went up north at the bend up here we didn't get much of that but when you had these orbiters two billion dollars each out there under your garages there uh things got pretty serious about, yeah, and, about and that the, was two billion dollars in 1979 dollars yeah there you go terry's got a wonderful story too about uh talking to the brass at Washington and them not uh, believing that they made it through the storms <laughs> in there. Uh, but uh, we want to just uh, brag about Terry here a little bit that uh, grew up in Ohio. Uh, well, you were uh, born in Ohio, but you grew up in the Paxton River, Maryland area where uh, the uh, Naval training base was, right? We have Navy test pilots. Uh, Terry's a Vietnam veteran, proud veteran of that Conflict flying. What kind of helicopters? HH-43. You were a, uh, a pilot, huh? No, I was a Maybe. crash rescue man. So it was my job to jump out of the helicopter and rescue the crew of a downed aircraft. Wow. You were in the conflict uh, the late, uh, like, what, mid-70s? No, 19, uh, 1969 and 70, 69, I was 70. over there. Yes. You, just, you just missed Marty over there. Yep. You were a baby over there compared to Marty. <laughs> he stirred it up before I got there. Yeah, he did in there. Well, we're bragging about uh, 
Marty Winkle, my co-producer here uh, for Stay Curious. We're in our fourth year. We're into, well, 900 episodes. Marty, how you doing? I went out to the Space Center today and saw Bob Senker. Uh, he only had one mission as a payload specialist with RCA, but what a great guy, just like you said, Marty. How you doing today? Say hi to Terry White, our popular Stay Curious visitor. Yeah, I'm doing good, Mark. Um, Terry, how are you doing? Doing good today, yeah. <laughs> You know, Marty, I think we need a little curl on my mustache, and you need to grow one because <laughs> the women around here are just going crazy when Terry White shows up here. We can't keep them down, and I'm talking about uh, Connie and, and uh, Anita, and everybody's just floating around here wanting to get a piece of Terry White, and, and we're glad of that because we're glad Terry's made friends here with the American Space Museum, and you've just not brought yourself here, Terry. You brought a whole lot of it. Uh, good people, and we certainly do appreciate that. Yeah, we even had an episode where my son and daughter got to come on the show. That's right. That was one of our favorite ones. Terry's what we call truly a national treasure, just like Marty here. They have stories and have done things for America's space age that have never been repeated and may never, ever be repeated again. Did you yeah. ever think about that, that your job will never be repeated again as manager of a horrible process? I cannot facility. see in the future of NASA building another reusable spacecraft like the shuttle yeah nor could john blaha astronaut he thought it'd be a hundred years before any country could maintain the, the what, what what we what we did there with our beautiful shuttle here or there well let's talk about hurricanes in the shuttle uh we just want to remind everybody that uh, tomorrow we've got steve agate here steve is a great communicator out there at k space center you just met steve I always think these shuttle guys, you know, knew each other. We did. Uh, I knew him. Oh, I, I thought I saw his face. But oh, yeah. okay, yeah. Right. But you saw him at the lunchroom or something like yeah. that. Yeah. At, at the peak of the shuttle's wonderful uh, legacy, how many people were physically at Kenny Space Center? Do you know? I think in the shuttle program, there were 16,000 contractor employees. I don't know how many NASA employees. Okay, so you had maybe at least close to 20,000 people Correct. going through the gates. Yes, uh, uh, on a weekly basis, let's say, out there. Yeah, uh, a today, lot of them knew the guy with the mustache, but the guy with the mustache didn't always know their name. <laughs> there you go. Uh, well, they, they, uh, and today, wow, I wonder how many today there are. Probably less than 5,000. Uh, traffic is not bad by my house. So. <laughs> <laughs> and you live out there on Merritt Island. Well, we can't wait to see stories from Steve Agid. Uh He really is a great communicator. We've He was on two years ago when Bart Martindale pinch hit for me on a vacation. And Steve's going to talk about Skylab at 50 years old. And the uh, second crew came back a couple weeks ago, 50 years ago. They had our friend Jack Lousem on there. We're going to get uh, Ed Gibson and the crew up there uh, uh, for Skylab 3 here uh, in, uh, in November. So we'll be talking about that. And Friday we'll be doing some future Fridays talking about living in, as they call it, LEO, okay. low Earth orbit. So uh, there's a lot of plans for a lot of humans to be in lo low Earth orbit. But right now, we only have 10 orbiting the Earth. Correct. Seven on our International Space Station and three on the Chinese Space Station. So, well, let's talk a little bit about hurricanes. There's Every astronaut says they look beautiful from space, and you just can't believe the destruction that is uh, is is packed into those things. Yes, um, and and like I said before, we're we've been pretty lucky on the space coast that we didn't have a lot of destruction from the hurricane. So, and Terry, I think we're lucky to be living in the 21st century when we can see hurricanes. But can, can you imagine not seeing a hurricane? Ooh, I thought that picture was going to come up. Oh, that's that's Nicole Stock. He, uh, Tropical Storm Nicole turned into a hurricane. That was the last one to really hit the, the coast here, the west side of the coast there. And uh, Nicole is a great friend of our museum there in the cupola with a, a T-shirt that says Hope on it. Uh, this is uh, one of the early, this is the, uh, I, I think this is Idalia that Marty picked as our screen. That was just a, a month ago. We kind of had a calm, calm uh, period here. Uh, but could you imagine living in the 60s and not knowing this monster was headed towards you? This is a 1963, one of the first hurricanes ever photographed, okay, uh, by a, a Tyro satellite. And did I write down the name of that hurricane? I most certainly did not. But um, 
uh, anyway, uh, left all my notes, I think, over there, which is typical of me doing. But, Terry, isn't that true that living down here in the 50s and 60s, there were some really bad hurricanes that snuck up on people? Yeah, they weren't aware they were coming. And, and I think amazing is the hurricane hunters, the military guys that and ladies that fly right into these storms to give us all the good data from the storms. They fly right through it and then uh, bring all that data back. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, flying in 115 mile an hour winds in a hurricane. And I like watching that on the the the, the, the weather station yes. stuff where they're doing that. Marty, would you hand me underneath my Rolodex there, my notes? And yes, I do have a Rolodex, friends. <laughs> I, I I like uh, uh, complete access to that. Thank you, sir. We've been very busy around here working on Steve's Aegis program for tomorrow and just the usual stuff going around here. Never a dull moment when you show up at the American Space Museum, is there, Terry? There's not. There's not. Okay. All right. Well, here, just wanted to throw in because we're talking about hurricanes. There, you know who that is? That's Mr. John Zarella. Oh, okay. In a CNN story that he did, he was inside a hurricane uh, 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 machine. To, to test uh, equipment and so forth that you could use to withstand hurricanes. So, uh, John Zarella, big shout out to you, uh, and uh, we'll have him back on our show here soon. Well, Carlton Bailey sent me these pictures of what Hurricane Francis did uh, in uh, 2004. No, that's, this is... Um, Francis was 2004. Yeah, 2004. September. Yeah. All right. Uh, and this was out at the... That is the um, Navajo that's out at the Sands History Museum and the entrance to the uh, Cape Ca uh, Canaveral Space Force now out there. So thank you for sharing that with us, Carlton. That storm also toppled what is an iconic out there, the, the uh, Redstone Rocket at the uh, Badging Station uh, right outside the south entrance to the uh, Kennedy Space Center. Not really the south entrance, it'd be the... West entrance. West entrance, okay. South entrance is on 3 north up there. So uh, this was Hurricane Francis in 2004 toppling the Mercury display. Carlton Bailey was there to, to see that. Uh, you remember anything about that? A little bit. Yeah? Yeah, that's the one that actually did the majority of the damage that's ever been done to the Kennedy Space Center, especially sh special shuttle related. That's okay. the one that tore the... And panels off of the vehicle assembly building. All right. Well, we're yeah. going to see that here in a second. Here is Francis, and then the damage it did out there to visit at the uh, property of Cape Canaveral on there. Marty, we got a comment? We have a comment from Carlton Bailey, mm -hmm. and Carlton's saying that's Matthew. So I'm not sure if he's talking about this hurricane or what. So, Carlton, you may want to elaborate. Okay. We got, we're going to get our hurricanes mixed up here because I didn't do a very good job of preparing the hurricanes for this show. But thank you. That was a... Yeah, uh, Matthew, Matthew was in 2016. Yeah, Matthew's yeah, in 2017. Okay. Okay. In there. And uh, uh, so what I wanted to show you here was uh, this preparedness journal. Took a few pictures of it on my desk there to emphasize that NASA has a program for everything out there. And this is a um, a page that uh, I thought that would show up better up there. Uh, these are the uh, uh, different hurricane preparedness actions. They created a whole series. Oh, yeah, that's what I thought was interesting there. Let me. This is the appendix that shows things that, that you would have out there, Terry. Uh, U.S. Orbiter Operations Hurricane Preparedness Plan. All areas hurricane preparedness supply inventory. Yeah, all and, the things you had to have. And this is this is the one that was really important for the rideout crew because it had all of the things that may they may need right at hand to go secure things if water started coming in anywhere, if a door was breached, anything like that. All of the different things that they needed to go take care of those. So you had 24 ba D-sized batteries, 12 flashlights, uh, six rolls of clear 10 foot by 100 inch uh, clear plastic rope, uh, three eighths inch rope and a half inch rope, trash bags, uh, 
uh, and you can't do anything without duct tape. That's right, twelve rolls of duct tape and a utility knife for you for those. Uh, do not use or operate tags. Yes, yeah. So there's any breach of any electrical system, automatically they put a tag on there so people would not use those things for the potential of water until. We had the electricians come in and verify everything was safe. But that also doesn't list all the mops and buckets and everything else that we staged ahead of time. That's just what the hurricane ride-out crew oh, okay. had for them in the way of materials. Along with that, since they were inside and riding out the storm, we also provided them with cots, pillows, blankets, food, and that. So all that was staged in my office to support them. Cots even, huh? Oh, yeah. Of course, yeah. The, the, they were the, there for days. Uh, now, Terry was part of the DART team, and he's going to talk about that in a second. But this is, again, I just want to emphasize that uh, no stone is unturned in NASA as they have a uh, the uh, infamous management tree for everything there. And there's Terry on the OPF High Bay 1 is one of the contacts there. Everybody's phone numbers was indispensable, it looks like. Uh, and uh, uh, there was always uh, lightning out there at the Space Center. In right. fact, not only hurricanes are you all, you know, that puts everybody on red alert. But what I find interesting is the levels that are laid out there for hurric uh, for lightning. Uh, lightning and tornadoes, because those come all of a sudden. So yeah. you only have limited preparation time for those. So You could be working in your OPF and there be a... A, a lightning strike somewhere, yeah. and then suddenly you're not allowed to leave that building, right? Yeah. Or or a tornado warning, then you have to leave the big hangar, which I always thought was the safest place, especially for people who are working inside the orbiter, a thing that withstands 17,500 miles per hour. Yeah. And I said, they're safer in there than anywhere else, but you had to get them all out and go to internal hallways that had no windows. Of course, our hangar had no windows, but yeah. So And everybody sit in the hall and wait till the storm or till the warning had passed and now where would uh if i'm a new hire or, or did you have regular management meetings a whole uh, uh assembly of people in an auditorium oh, oh yeah. or yeah yeah we would have those and we would have them right there in the hangar where the the bay manager would get everybody together and discuss things like that but we briefed them in the, in their team meetings and especially when it was a hurricane was imminent we'd breach the crews at their start of ship meetings around the mm -hmm. clock as to what the plan was and what they'd do if it if it was determined we would you know stand down from processing and uh, concentrate on our hurricane preps and if we would evacuate the space center then that would come down and uh, then they would have to monitor the news if they were at home mm -hmm. if we shut down the space center what i found interesting just like you do around your home you know people have got to go around the building and and remove all materials uh that could aren't tied Every, down everything and, is loose yes. uh check roofs for loose materials tie down antennas uh did you have one guy in charge of all the sandbags because i bet you use a lot of sandbags we did yeah we had yeah. we had the uh facilities guys would deliver the sandbags and we would put them all in place so yeah yeah i like having sandbags around uh when when this threat comes on here uh, they have, uh, uh, you have different uh, three days out, two days out alerts, and then, then the day, day of the incident, uh, you have to secure a lot of vehicles. Well, and remember, when it got imminent, we also had, if we have a, a shuttle out at the launch pad, we had to get the crawler back underneath it and bring the orbiter, uh, the space shuttle back into the VAB. And about not, a year ago, we had that happening with the Artemis One, yeah, correct? Yep. Well, we had it had it happen four or six times during the shuttle program. Mm -hmm. I mean, we monitored the weather and made delay rolling out of the VAB based on weather. But once it was out there at the pad, we had to roll back for quite a few other reasons, payload reasons, uh, woodpecker reasons and that. Yeah, but, right. but, but for uh, hurricanes, it turns out I th there was either four or six times we had to roll back because of the right. storm. So. Lots of times it would get all prepped to roll back, the crawler underneath it, getting ready to pick it up, and then the storm would change, and they'd say, okay, leave it out there. So, 
And who's making that decision? That's the management team. The higher NASA management mm-hmm. team makes that decision. So they, you know, we we had our own weather specialists that monitored that, but the, on based on their recommendations, and they looked at it. And but like I said, historically, our area has been pretty safe from hurricanes. Well, thirty years you were out there. I guess there's only pretty much a handful you think about, huh? Yep. Yep. Out there, we're gonna see some of the damage from some of those. The uh, here's what I liked: if you're on the ride out crew, and uh, which you weren't, but you were on the the the, the crew that checked things out after. Yeah. I like this part. It says, "Here, here's your action required: obtain your dart badge, your 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 that, badge." That's to be the out damage there. and resessment team and damage and recovery team. Okay, dart damage and recovery team. Yeah. Then attend your meetings for specific instructions, and then you leave to secure your home for the storm. And I like that, that NASA's thinking of your family and your home. Yeah, you and go you home and take care of all your preps at kiss home. Kiss your wife goodbye. And, and then come because you may be out here for several <laughs> or days. Or goodbye. Days before you get to leave again. And then you return to work, and then you get to... Uh, it says obtain right out equipment from logistics and blue goose. Yeah. We're not talking about blue goose vodka there, are we? No. No, blue goose, <laughs> blue goose was was another supply area we had that handled special parts and all that. But from logistics they'd go and pick up uh, the uh, cots and the food and that that we already had staged for them and that. Pretty cool that they have a whole procedure here. May 2004 was probably one of the last revisions. This, of course, is the United Space Alliance, USA, that was the operations management for. Of history, if my memory is correct, we put out a new one every year. So in our preps before the hurricane season, they would amend the thing and put it out most of the time there were not many changes but yeah how much did this change uh, from the uh half of the half of the shell era was before the internet basically yeah and the other half you you're doing emails and so forth like that but but in the 80s and 90s you're there's a lot of paperwork going around correct and, and holy joe's uh being on your desk or or, or manila or those yep. brown envelopes yeah, and meetings <laughs> and meetings and meetings and meetings yeah yeah uh did uh did the internet ease some of that uh and in my world not a lot uh-huh. there was still a lot of face-to-face communication so okay. yeah all right yeah well let's look at some of the damage done that's a bill engel shot that's obviously last year when uh the artemis one was out there on the pad and boy it went through five or six very nasty storms out there we had some lightning storms while that thing was out there. Uh, of course, uh, the August uh, scrub uh, came down to uh, uh, whatever was the problem with it, and then it had finally flew in the middle of the night in November. But uh, I was well, amazed yeah. at all the rain that thing could take. Oh, yeah. We had a lot of lightning storms with Apollo, I understand, and we had a lot of lightning storms with the, during the shuttle program, too. Well, let's look at the very real damage that can be. Yes, that is a... A, a trailer, a mobile home trailer there. Yeah, use those for portable offices. So. And that plum just got blown over on its side. Let me see if I can re- grab the uh, uh, series of notes there. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think which one that was. I, I want to I say that's what, Francis. Yeah, I don't know what storm that it was. It doesn't matter. Well, if Francis is the one that did the most damage. Yeah, so... Which building is that? That is that the uh, uh, no, that's not the TSP or T- TPSF. TPS. No, that's not it. So, yeah, so uh, I don't know which building that is. Well, yeah, that's some real damage that happened in the shuttle, and uh, I threw that in there. Okay, now this is the this story. Is, there's a story behind this. This is, this is Francis. So, we had actually evacuated everybody, including the ride out crew, from. The order of process. Oh, two so love for even the write out crew. Everybody. So uh, that was the only time that I left my house out of all the hurricanes. And I came right here to this building. A friend of mine owned the building. Our American Museum. Space Museum. Museum. Yes. yes. So uh, this is a very secure building. It was <clears throat> uh, a county building to retain records and that. So it should withstand the storm. So we came here and wrote it out. But I was on the DART team, the first group to go back in. So. Uh, 
when they finally decided that security would let us back in, then the dark team went in and inspected the area before we let anybody come back in. No repair crews, no technicians, nobody, until we went around and repaired everything. And we went around and went to OPF and we're checking it out and two of the hangars had lost power. One still retained its power in that. But we went around and said, hey, the orbiters are all fine. There's no damage. Well, apparently people in Washington didn't believe that. Really? So they said, no, we need to see something live to show us that, that they're not. So they said, well, we got to have somebody in the picture. So I crawled out, looked out above the wing on Atlantis and showed them, look, there's no water, there's no debris, no nothing, nothing breached the building. So we did have panels from the VAB struck and made holes in the side of OPF2. Hmm. That's you 19 years ago. You guys got hit by Charlie, then Francis, then Ivan, and then Gene well, in well, the same year. Well, t t a lot of people don't remember it, but right after Francis, in the same month, yeah, Jeannie, Gene came and that, and it tore more panels off of the VAB because they hadn't been able to repair all of them yet. It took a couple of years to replace all the fasteners on the VAB, <clears throat> but yeah, it tore more panels off. So we had two hurricanes that did damage in one month. Wow, we'll see some pictures of that, and Terry will talk about these panels in detail. Yes, Marty? Yeah, Gary Gerald is asking, what is the elevation above sea level at the Space Center, and how prone was flooding? Well, flooding wasn't wasn't a big problem in most of the orbiter processing areas, but this is, KSC is primarily a, a swamp. So, yeah. you know, that's why everything was built up higher than that. But my understanding from the hurricane briefings, if we ever had a hurricane that breached the sand dunes out at the ocean, and actually we had storm surge come all the way over the dunes, they said the majority of Kennedy Space Center would probably have 48 inches of water standing in it. Four feet. Yeah, which meant... You know, we weren't processing anything. So even if the orbiters and the VAB were high and dry, all of the support facilities that we needed for launch, a lot of those would be out of service for a year or more. So if we'd have had a bad breach, we wouldn't have flown for a couple of years. And to answer Gary Gerald's question there, he's our Vidalia onion farmer there okay. in Georgia. Uh, I gave you some onions, too. I just I had think. some this week. So. Yeah, yeah, well, there you go, Gary. I think it's about four feet, officially, is yeah. the sea level. And you can go around areas here in Titusville that's actually below sea level. Correct. You're saying. I look at that on my GPS thing once in a while on there. But uh, And, yes, the global climate change is an issue that Kennedy Space Center has uh, been looking at because any increase in the ocean uh, height is going to affect the shorelines uh, uh, everywhere in our country, all over the world. But uh, uh, they've uh, given some assurance that they can handle things like that. What I find interesting is nobody being on Kennedy Space Center during Hurricane Francis and think of the billions and billions of dollars of assets laying around there that only the armadillos and if you can replace assets, you can't replace lives. There you go. And that is something that I, uh, you can replace assets, you can't replace lives. That reminds me, Terry, I'm going to find something else in here that, di that directly says to that is, is there we're talking a, a big mess there. Where's that? At? Okay, that is the TPSF. That is the Thermal protection. protection System Facility. So that is directly across from OPF 1 and 2, right across the towway. And that is the facility that builds a lot of the flight parts for the thermal protection system. They build new tiles there. They build the flexible insulation blankets there. They build all of the gap fillers and all the hardware we need to refurbish an orbiter from one flight to the next, thermal protection wise, it's generally built right there in that facility. Uh, they have some some one-of-a-kind sewing machines in there for, for sewing the thermal blankets. So that uh, basically tore the roof off and that is the blanket fabrication area right there in that photo and it shut that down so we had to go to having downey california and palmdale california make our tiles and make our blankets which delayed our processing efforts because i could have a tile made in a couple of days right across the street but when i had to get it from california it took a lot longer to get it hmm. so uh yeah that that 
changed our processing that even though the orbiters weren't damaged, the facilities that supported the orbiters were damaged. Amazing. Here in this book, uh, this report, not report, this is the guidepost, their, their guidelines of living through a hurricane, your damage assessment uh, team there, it says under here, item B, safety, capital S-A-F-E-T-Y is paramount. Lives will not be endangered to secure or service flight hardware, provide fire protection, security repair, or fuel generators during the storm. All personnel will cease operations when winds get up to 55 miles an hour. So uh, so basically when we came back, as we went around assessing things, you weren't allowed to get near any down lines, whether you suspected they were still alive or not. Anything that looked like it could be a problem, then you had to call the particular system that handled that. So you had people like me that, that assessed what was going on with the orbit and those facilities. And then we had facility electricians come out to check different things mm -hmm. out. So, but basically it was walk lightly. Don't touch anything until you're assured that it's safe. Did you communicate with walkie talkies uh, with p people walking around? Yeah. Yep, we had radios to communicate with one another. Uh -huh. So, but with that, we had to go out not just the main buildings that we looked at. We had to go out and assess all the other buildings before we could give an all clear, and that wasn't a, I wasn't responsible for the all clear. But we had to go around and check everything out, and then tell the local news that people were not supposed to report back to work yet. And we had people coming to the gates trying to get in, and security calling. Hey, they said I said that they're not on the critical list, so tell them to go back home. So. Were there any, as part of the DART team out there, did you have any surprises that uh, you saw? I've... Well, some of the things, like we climbed up and saw the panels had come hundreds of feet from the uh, VAB and slammed into the side of the OPF. That was a big surprise. They went over one of the buildings and hit the building behind it. Oh, wow. I didn't so, think yeah, about that. Oh, yeah. And debris was everywhere. How about the animal life while I'm thinking about it? You know what? I didn't see a lot of animals that look like they're in distress. They're usually pretty good about about that but no it wasn't you wouldn't didn't drive around and see dead birds all over the place anything or anything gator like that. thrown on top of a roof or something nope. like that <laughs> no nope. we had more gators injured in forest fires out there uh -huh. that i saw yeah it uh -huh. would cook them wow well okay tennessee people like that yeah <laughs> gator haters there carlton thank you for contributing this this is a picture in 2016 uh i guess that would have been um uh, what am I thinking? Which one's 26? Oh, uh, Matthew. Yeah, Matthew. Matthew in 2016 there. That was a nasty one up and down the state there. But Carlton's got his telephoto lens on there seeing a Air Force building over there. Pad, uh, that's probably pad 41. And then uh, some damage on the... Uh, uh, what, what was that damage on... Oh, that's the utility building during Matthew. Okay. On there. That looks like that's behind the launch. That's right course. off of the crawler way. You can oh, see all the gravel oh, yeah, yeah, out yeah, there for the crawler. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, halfway between. Would that the... stone get blown off of there? Or something no, like uh, no. That's halfway between the VAB and the pad. Well, now there's some that don't look too good. Yeah. So the panels, and this is the south side of the VAB, uh, but the panels did not fail. Their fasteners were corroded. So. When the wind got strong enough, it just peeled the panels off because of the rusty bolts couldn't hold them in place. Hmm. So, you know, it wasn't a, a downgrade of the panel, but yeah. Now, so, let's talk about the size proportions here on this 550-foot-tall largest one-story building in the world. I'm told the American flag is the size of a basketball court, I think. Yes. No, it, no, the... The, the, the blue is the size well, of the basketball The American court. flag is, yeah, larger than a basketball court. but The blue is the yeah, basketball court. Yeah, right. each stripe that you see on that flag is the width of a traffic lane. Oh, okay. To put it in perspective. All right. So, so yeah. Uh, and then the meatball there, of course, is gigantic. Uh, so, these panels are big. These panels are, what? Four yeah. feet by six yeah. feet or something like that? Four feet by probably six feet or eight wow. feet, yeah. So if they fell off, if they got blown off the VAB, they're going to land somewhere. Correct. All right. So you're saying that created a lot of havoc. Yeah. And they went went to the left of that picture we are just looking at. That they, they went to the left, the majority of them, and all across the parking lot over toward the OPF, across the highway, and out into the marsh 
west of the OPFs. Now, today, Kennedy Space Center has lots of video cameras everywhere. Not the case. 30, 700. 700 video cameras. Yes. All right. So were people monitoring the storm from these video cameras? I don't know that they had any cameras looking at that. They had some cameras, there, but then they didn't have the ability to switch cameras if there was nobody on the Space Center anymore. Because in my office, if I wanted to watch things going on in other areas, I could call over and get them to switch me onto a particular area, and I could look and watch people working huh. from my desk. I okay. preferred to go down there and watch them work in person, but I could watch them from my desk. So, Did you have a joystick to move things around? Nope, it was just on my, on my or... screen and <laughs> select this and select that. So uh -huh. We did finally go to computers. Well, I think everybody just kind of assumes in today's or quarter way through the 21st century, if, if you don't think you're on camera, like, you know, most of the time you're out in public, you need to think again, right? Correct. There's cameras everywhere. Uh, but one more per picture, that, that ter the damage there, there's, uh, of course, you got to clean up the damage and that people are making money off of that. Yeah. There's some... Uh, so heavy equipment was out, out, out there as soon as we gave them approval to come out and that thing was safe to start getting all the debris out of the way and opening up the parking lots and that so we could actually bring the workers back. Would you bring in uh, cl contractors for cleanup? Uh, actually, or would you actually the heavy equipment folks out there did most of the cleanup, yeah. Okay. And uh, they love that. They like getting those big machines up there and showing them what they can do there. So, uh, well, great. That's... Uh, uh, you know, that's a, kind of all the pictures we have of our showing you the damage out there. We hope we don't have to show you any more pictures. Here we are uh, in the middle of uh, October and hurricane season. The last couple of weeks have been pretty quiet, actually, but you the, never the know. The whole hurricane season so far has been pretty quiet. Yeah. But if you look at history, October and November does get busy. Technically, December 1st is when it ends, right? Yeah, but we've had them later than that. So. And the oceans are warmer. I thought we'd have a few more wilder things going on by now with yeah, the, I don't the warm remember oceans, what the projections but, uh, were for this year. Uh, well, Terry, we'd love to love you filling us in on there's just something I didn't share with uh, you that you'd like to bring out to the audience about hurricanes out there. No? Nope, it was just a lot of prep work and hope it didn't hit us and then restoring everything after, putting everything away and getting back, picking up where you were and you, you lost two or three days of processing, which, you know, the people that scheduled everything didn't like that. Idea. Right, and yeah. astronauts particularly scheduling their tight schedules yes, with yes, not but, only training but personal appearances. Yeah, but and, as long as the flight hardware wasn't damaged and the facilities were still operable. So, you know, we worked around it and got the TPSF back online as soon as we could. So, Well, we appreciate Doug Forrest watching, an excellent artist out there near uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, big day in NASA today, as I say, JPL. Larry Pusker is watching. He may have been watching. Larry, were you watching the uh, NASA uh, this morning at 11 o'clock? They revealed the uh, sample of the asteroid oh, did uh, that was okay. brought back yeah yeah Bennu uh I'm about halfway through watching the rerun of that Dave Stangy's watching up in Michigan Cynthia Rossi's watching uh Gary Gerald uh thank you for your question Gary uh Bill Whiting's watching up in Michigan he's uh he's now uh, splitting his time between the Space Coast and we appreciate Bill You've met Bill. He's becoming mm -hmm. one of our new volunteers here. Lynn Feather is watching from West Virginia. She was my admin. Okay. Admin. Administrative. Assistant. Assistant. So. Okay, yes. Lynn. Straighten out the boss here, okay? Just emailed Marty. Uh, Peggy Holbert. My sister. That's your sister. Neil 1080 is watching. And Carlton Bailey, CB, is always keeping me straight here on Stay Curious. Appreciate that. Enjoyed talking to you last night. Carlton and I are going to be getting our Godzilla on Sunday. Okay. We're going to a Comic-Con, and I love watching the Comic-Con people, and, and uh, Carlton's very into Godzilla. And he got me into Godzilla. It's really, you know, okay. things I don't know about I like getting involved in. And there's a whole world out there This of the uh, uh, the greatest monster ever, Godzilla. Okay. Out there. Well, we're talking about <laughs> King of the Monsters. People watching, my daughter Rebecca who was here on the show, yeah. said she was going to watch today. And I have to say hi to uh, Renee, 
Riley, LJ, and Lane. All her, right. Her four children. So some grandkids in there, and I know you can't wait. To, you're always wanting to go out there and see them in the Louisiana. Correct. Down there. So, Marty, got a comment or question? Yeah, Dave Stangy is asking. I'm sorry, Dave Stangy is asking, how long would it take to go out and get a shuttle and bring it back to the VAB if a storm hit? Okay, the the preps for the storm it it takes uh, several shifts to get the space shuttle out at the launch pad prepared, but we always kept a crawler parked at the bottom of the pad, uh, then just in case, so you didn't have to drive it all the way out there because it's a slow trip for it. But then it would go up, they would mate it to it, and then bring it back. But it only travels a half a mile an hour with the hardware on top of it, with a vehicle on top of it. So it would take several hours to get it back from the pad. Eight to ten hours. Yes, once you did all the preps. So you had to plan ahead of time, and you didn't want to wait till the winds got real strong to bring it back. Mm -hmm. But so, Did you make T-shirts, I survived Hurricane Francis? <laughs> the, that the, the, they made them, but I didn't wear one. So. <laughs> okay, in there. Well, uh, I see a lot of T-shirts. In fact, I got one laying around here that... Uh, Jay Honeycutt gave me the 35 new guys I'm going to wear in a show one day there. So, Well, Terry, thank you for telling us about some part of Kenny Space Center that you don't often think about, the hurricanes, the hurricane preparedness. This is our nation's spaceport. you got to protect those assets out there. And, uh, uh, you know, I think it's an amazing story, and we're glad that you're here to tell it. I know Cliff Watson, who had a birthday yesterday. Cliff is our friend down in Pomona, Australia. Okay. So he's enjoying spring. First days of spring down there in Australia. Uh, on the uh, He's on the east side of Australia there where all the action is. Cliff, thank you for watching and supporting our American Space Museum. Met him uh, five years ago during the Great American Eclipse. And his friend Dave Renicky. Dave Renicky is an excellent popularizer of astronomy in Australia. You guys come back here, you know you're going to be sitting here with me and we'll talk about that. Appreciate Cliff Watson. We appreciate everybody out there supporting our American Space Museum. As in November, we'll be doing a fun drive. You can always support our museum uh, by uh, uh, on our website at our donation button up there. And you'll be supporting programs like this where we bring in space leaders as well as what we call national treasures like Terry and Marty Winkle, my co-producer, to share their stories about a career that will never, ever be repeated. All right, as far as uh, our shuttle era and our Apollo moon landing era. So thank you, my friend. We appreciate yeah. all that you did. And people didn't realize it, but in the early days, because of the potential of the orbiter having to come down somewhere other than the United States, we had potential landing sites all around the world. Yes. Including Australia. Okay. So... Uh, I met a guy out at the visitor center one day that was at the landing site, one of the landing sites for Australia. Huh. And because of the delay in getting uh, Columbia up for its first flight, John Young and Bob Crippen actually traveled around the world and went to these potential landing sites to thank the people working there. Did they? And this guy brought with him the thing that they had signed when they came to visit him there, and he wanted to bring it back to the Space Center and show it to people here. So That is a wonderful story there. Yeah, that's a great story. I can see, I can see Young and Crippen wanting to do that. Yep. They, they seem to be very hands-on and and yeah. talk to the workers. And, and they were trained out. <laughs> they yeah. practice, practice, practice. Yeah, they were, they were trained, trained out. Yeah. Yeah. Fly, yeah. I, so. I remember Bruce McCandless saying, of course, he flew the man maneuvering unit untethered for the first time. Yeah. And McCandless said he had about 12 years training for that yeah. two-hour moment. He yeah. was well overtrained, he said, on that. So, well, Terry, thank you again. We can't wait to see you with what you have to bring us in the month of November. Uh, great job here talking about hurricanes we hope we don't see one the rest of this year and uh, we are enjoying some nice cooler weather uh, finally finally down here so uh you even saw people wearing sweaters so they can't wait to do that down here <laughs> so uh thank you very much terry thank you marty for a great job on our Streamlabs production here tomorrow we're going to have this gentleman coming in there he is doing his thing jumping around the uh, space center uh 
Steve Agid. Steve Agid has been a space worker, and he is one of the top communicators out there at the Kennedy Space Center. And Steve is going to be talking about the 50th anniversary of the Skylab program. So we're looking forward to that tomorrow. So until then, I'm Mark Marquette, thanking everybody for today's show and thanking our good friend uh, all around the world for appreciating us out there. I was trying to think of Cliff Watson out there. And, of course, we thank Terry White for what he brings to help you all stay curious. Until tomorrow with Steve Agin and talking about a half a century ago in Skylab, I'm Mark Marquette saying we can't wait to see you in our museum to bridge the space between us.